Turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles to Luke chapter 18. Trust that you are bringing your Bible every week, that, um, that you are, uh, I don't know, taking notes there or wherever it's convenient, but want you to, we're about what is the Bible teaching us. We're anxious every week to understand what it says and to live it, and so that's what we do. So we're in Luke 18. We're looking at the parable in verses 9 through 14. Started uh, on that last week. This week we want to look at a certain element of that. It's illustrated uh, a little bit by this little cartoon character. Charlie Brown was talking to uh, Linus one day about the persistent sense of inadequacy in his life. He says, Linus, it's, it's, it was bad. He said, it was born, it, it, it started the moment I stepped foot on the stage of life. He said, they took a one look at me and said, not right for the part. And I think that's the way a lot of us feel. The truth is we have a feeling of inadequacy that we're not quite right for the part. And whether we realize it or not, at the bottom of that sense of inadequacy is a sense that we're not right with God. God is built into us, whether we deny it or whether we will acknowledge it or not, he's built into us a sense of himself. And so when these feelings come, they are a realization that we are not on our own right with God. So for most people, this means, well, must do something. I have to do something to make me feel good enough. Perhaps that's you this morning. That's your approach to life. If so, Jesus has some very special words for you. He is addressing, as you'll look in the passage in verse 9 of Luke 18, he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. So these are people whose religion was, if I can just be good enough, I'll be in. I'll be acceptable to God, and I will be, in that sense, righteous. Were they right? Well, Jesus answers that question in the parable by indicating that they were not. He tells this parable that has two men in it, two very different men, and in verse 14, he derives this conclusion at the end of his parable. He says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, rather than the other. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus is telling us one person in this parable was not acceptable to God. One person was not in. In simple terms, one man in this parable was going to heaven, the other one was not. And the really the kicker is that it's the do-gooder. It's the one who is determined to do his absolute best outwardly who is not in. So it's important that we understand what this parable is about, right? These men took two radically different approaches to gain acceptance with God. Tim Keller points out that one of them took the outside-in approach, the other one took the inside-out approach. The outside-in approach said, I'll be as good as I can. I will keep God's law to the best of my ability, and if I can't keep it, I'll make up my own version of it. And I will keep that and be faithful to that. He was working outside in. The other one was working inside out. He realized that it was the heart that mattered. <clears throat> His life was a shambles. He'd made every wrong decision that there was possible to make. But at the end of the day, he realized that he could not get himself right with God, that his heart was the thing that mattered, and he came and pronounced himself the sinner that he was, begged for mercy, and was justified. It was a dirty, rotten scoundrel of a tax collector who was ultimately declared right with God, and it was the outward-looking Pharisee who... If we saw him, we would have thought he's a great guy who's declared unrighteous by Jesus himself. The outside-in approach did not work. It was not acceptable. Jesus' audience 
would have carefully took note of that. Why? Because that's the approach almost all of them were taking. They were following the lead of the Pharisees of the time. They were working outside in. They believed that the way to get right with God was to do everything right, and Jesus rejected that. So it's important that we understand what this is about, right? What, is, what are some of the characteristics of this approach that didn't work? That's what I want to do today, and then next week we'll look at the inside-out approach. But let's look today at the wrong way, the outside-in, the self-centered approach that was taken by most of the people in this audience. Jesus described them as those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. They declared themselves righteous. You just have to think about that for a moment to realize the stupidity. It's like a person walking into a courtroom who's been arrested you know, for stealing a loaf of bread or something. He walks in and the judge said, how do you plead? And the guy said, well, I, let me tell you, judge, I'm 95% good. I'm way better than anybody else that I see in this courtroom. So the fact that I stole this loaf of bread because my family was hungry shouldn't count against me. I declare myself righteous. See you later. That's the outside in approach. And there's a lot of things wrong with it, as you can see, and that's what Jesus is going to tell us here. There are two, two basic things that I see that are wrong here. First of all, the Pharisees were trusting in themselves, not in God. That's a problem. Secondly, they were judging based on outward appearance, not on inward heart attitude. So they were both self-righteous and self-sufficient. So let's look at those two things. What does it mean to be self-righteous? Let's look at the Pharisee beginning in verse 11. Luke 18, verse 11. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I can get. This man is a, I, I think in our day we might call him a spin doctor. He sounds good at first. I mean, he says the right word right at the beginning, right? God. He addresses God. God, I thank you. But listen, tell me. Let me tell you, it's all downhill after that. He mentions God that one time. He never mentions God again. Having said that he thanks God, he begins to list all the good things that he has done. He's not, this, listen, this is not a prayer to God. This is a prayer informing God what a great guy he is. This is the essence of self-justification. Kent Hughes says this about this. Prayer. He says, after his initial nod to God, his was essentially a self-congratulatory monologue disguised as a prayer. Do you know you can pray and it's not real? Disguised as a prayer. That's what this is. There are five uses of the personal pronoun I. I, 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 I. He was stoned on self. That's what Hughes says, and he's right. He's right. This is not a prayer. It was an ex exercise in self-congratulations. No, no prayer. There's no praise in this prayer. There's no humility. There's no coming before God and recognizing the awe and reverence that belongs to Him. Most of all, there's no repentance. There's no confession. There's no acknowledgement of sin. There's no sense of the divine presence here at all. The truth is, He's not really addressing God. Who is he addressing? He's addressing himself. And he's addressing those around him who will hear. You remember that elsewhere Jesus says about the Pharisees, you guys are prone to long prayers because you're trying to impress those around you. And that's exactly what this man is doing. He's trying to elevate himself in the eyes of those around him and in his own eyes. But beloved, I have to ask, don't we sometimes do the same thing? You ever heard a prayer or a testimony that went something like this, you know? I thank you, Lord, for taking care of my family, for blessing us. You know, since the time that we began to tithe, our business has grown every year. Since we have given our hearts and lives to you, you have protected our family, you've kept our children on the straight and narrow. I'm really thankful. Now listen, could that be a prayer of thanksgiving? It could. 
But how often is that just a prayer to demonstrate to others how wonderful we are, that we've put God under obligation by our actions and God delivered. It has no sensitivity to or recognition of the fact of all the people around who have been just as faithful and maybe more so, but are suffering because their children have gone astray or because they've had financial setbacks for no really good outward reason. It doesn't recognize those who are having their heads chopped off by ISIS that have been far more faithful than probably any of us have been. We are very prone, beloved, to these same kind of self-congratulatory prayers. Somebody, somebody wrote this in the paper in Boston one time. He was talking about a, 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 there had been a visiting pastor who came through and he said the pastor offered the most elegant prayer ever heard or ever addressed to a Boston audience. That was a good description of a prayer that was only intended for those who were listening and really wasn't a heartfelt address to God. Nietzsche saw this long ago. He said that when people declare their morality, it's a power play. He said when we're saying I'm a good person so God has to accept me and give me a good life, and because God has to accept me, you have to accept me because I'm good. It's just a morality play that we're going through, but it's all backwards. People who are in Christ don't declare their righteousness. People who are in Christ understand that doing the right thing, getting it right, is not the way that we get accepted by God. We do the right thing because we've already been accepted by God on the basis of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, which is the only way to get accepted by God. Tendency towards self-justification ran deep in the Jewish psyche. So there was a prayer recorded by one man, a Rabbi Simeon, Ben Jakai. He wrote this, he said, if there are only two righteous men in the world, I and my son are these two. If there is only one, I am he. It's an extreme example, but we have to be careful. That's not representative of kind of what we are underlying under the hood, right? He's just being upfront about what sometimes we are inside. He apparently forgot it's not he that judges. When he says, if there's only one righteous guy in the world, then it's got to be me. Who judges that? God gets to judge that. Beloved. We don't get to judge that. Declaring oneself good enough is at the heart of moralism. All moralism has that. Moralists have, you know, moralists are those, and, and, and this is another way to check, is it, could this possibly be me? They have their little list. Here's the things that I've done. Therefore, these are the things that God owes me. You don't say it quite that way. But at the bottom of your heart, there's this feeling, okay, I went to church today, God owes me. I gave to the building fund, God owes me. I went out and helped the poor today, God owes me. I helped somebody across the street today, God owes me. I went out of my way to help my neighbor change his flat tire, and I was late for work, God owes me. That's a moralist. We, we not only have our list of things that we've done that put God in our oblig under obligation to us, put God in debt to us, we have our list of reasons that we don't do certain things. You know, some of those commands in the Bible are great, but some of those commands are outdated. They belong to the first century, not to the 21st century, and put, we put our own spin on this. Here's why this is not appropriate to me. This is a different age. Those commands belong to an ancient age, and so we justify ourselves. So clever. We're actually being people pleasers rather than God pleasers. A few weeks ago, I, I can't remember just how long, but a few months ago, on uh, I think it's 48 hours, one of those TV you know, kind, of, one of those kind of shows in a way, this little town of Gerald, Missouri was featured. I don't know where that is. I don't know where John is. I, we don't know either. Somewhere in Missouri. Gerald, Missouri had one of the highest methamphetamine problems in the country. That is, it had that problem until Sergeant Bill Jacob arrived. Sergeant Bill came from the FBI, headed a task force with the FBI that was, that was uh, and he, he was undercover with that task force, and he was there to help take care of this problem. Well, the chief 
a guy named Ryan McCrary was only too happy to have any help he could get, and so he turned Sergeant Bill loose on the town. And for the next two months, shotgun in hand, Sergeant Bill was break, kicking in doors and taking names and arresting 20 people, most of whom confessed, until a local reporter started thinking, this looks a little strange. He did a background check on Sergeant Bill, and he found out that his, you know, his relationship with the FBI was not one of an employee, it was one of a arrestee. And so the FBI was called in, and they did some more checking, and the first thing you know, Sergeant Bill was up on 20 counts himself, and he got five years in prison for impersonating officers and for fraud, etc. Katie Couric in in <coughs> interviewed Sergeant Bill. He admitted his impersonation and he admitted the lies, but he justified himself this way. He said, I'm going to prison for arresting drug dealers who aren't going to prison. Sounds pretty good, right? Kitty Couric was smart enough to say, well, let me tell you, Sergeant Bill, that's not why you're going to prison. So you missed the point. You thought your good intentions were good enough. Beloved, uh, good intentions will never cover for an unrepentant heart. You can't substitute one for the other. The judge could see through what he was trying to do, and though he was careful to declare himself good enough, society declared him not good enough, and God will be doing the same thing for just self-justifiers. Those who declare themselves righteous will find out they weren't nearly as righteous as they thought. Good enough. How about the second one, self-righteousness, the second characteristic of someone who is a self-justifier? Well, they are self-sufficient. They are self-sufficient. The self-sufficiency of this Pharisee is immediate right away. I mean, you look at him in verse 11 there, it says the Pharisee standing by himself. Now contrast that with the with the tax collector in verse 13, but the tax collector was standing far off. These are the kind of little things you want to note in a passage of Scripture when you're interpreting it, because Luke is using the physical, the, the, the physical location or position of these men to contrast the inner attitude of them. The tax collector is perfectly comfortable to go away from the crowd, closer to the place of God's express presence or implied presence in the temple because he believes, this, in, this indicates his inner heart's feeling that he can bridge the gap between himself and God. The tax collector stands far off. Why? Because he makes no attempt to bridge the gap. He realizes he has no hope to bridge the gap between himself and God. But the Pharisee thinks he can. The Pharisee comes close. Because he thinks on his own he deserves to have that location. You know, if you just looked at him, you might think the same thing. He looked like an upstanding guy. I mean, I mean, you look at the description, there's no reason to disbelieve him when he says that he doesn't cheat on his taxes. He's faithful to his wife. He's fair to his employees. He's not a he's a person who's loyal to his country. That's what all those words that he says about himself really imply. He gives his tithes and beyond. I mean, what pastor wouldn't want that kind of person in their church? Who of us wouldn't welcome him? He's a good guy. He could be any one of us, beloved. That's the problem. He could be any one of us. Because outwardly, we look really good. And yet Jesus says at the end of the parable, this is the one who went home unjustified, unacceptable to God. Can we miss the point? It's not good enough to be good enough. There has to be more. Why was his self-sufficiency not good enough? Two reasons. And these, these are crystal clear in this passage. I hope the Holy Spirit will, will apply this to all of our lives. There's two reasons why self-sufficiency will never work. First of all, it's the wrong tape measure. He was using the wrong standard. The standard by which he measured himself and measured his acceptability was not a divinely ordained standard. What was the standard? It's really clear. Verse 11, I am not like other men. 
What was his standard? Everybody around him. His standard was other people. And against them, he looked pretty good. He didn't, he didn't participate in the evil that he saw all around him. Extortion, cheating, injustice, sexual immorality, taking advantage of others, betraying one's people and one's country by being a tax collector just for the money. Against that standard, he measured really good. Against that standard, he was fine. Furthermore, he tells us, I, I fast twice a week. I tithe. You know what that's about? He's given himself extra credit. The, tithe, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, fasting was required in, under Jewish, God's Old Testament Jewish law only on the Day of Atonement. This guy was practicing Pharisee, which meant he, he practiced fasting on Monday and Thursday of every week, twice a week, way above what was required. He tithed, even... The Bible tells us they even tied their spices and their mints and everything. So, you know, I, I, they went to the grocery store. They came home with ten apples. One of them they somehow gave to the poor. They tithed everything. Extra credit. If somehow I missed something over here, surely it's got to be covered by this over here. This is his standard. Now, there, there is one interesting thing here that I think is interesting. If you notice, he doesn't... He doesn't exactly pick the cream of the crop when he decides who to compare himself against, right? He doesn't pick Moses and Daniel and Joseph and some of the great men in the Old Testament. He picks the tax collector and those who are extortionists and other criminals in society. His yardstick isn't really a yardstick, it's a footstick, right? Or probably an inch stick. But against that, he feels pretty good. The truth is, even if he had compared himself against the best of the best, he would still have probably looked pretty good outwardly. He would be very representative of the way Pharisees thought. Here's another, here's another quote, a prayer from another Pharisee. It's included in the Mishnah. He wrote it this way. He said, I thank thee, Lord, that thou hast put my part with those who sit in the academy, that is, among those who are educated and not with those who sit in the street corners. For I rise early and they rise early. I rise early to the words of the law. They rise early to vain things. I labor and they labor, but I labor and receive a reward. They labor and receive no reward. I run and they run, but I run to the life of the world to come and they run to the pit of destruction. This Pharisee could have prayed that. This Pharisee was praying that. He was counting himself righteous based on the wrong standard got the wrong yardstick. God's standard, beloved, please get this. God's standard is not other people. God's standard is himself. God's standard is not other people. God's standard is himself. That's why Jesus, I mean, it's exactly what Jesus said when he said, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. The standard isn't good enough. The standard is perfection against the character of God. Who among us can say we've met that standard? If you want to self-justify, though, that's where you have to go. If you want to declare yourself righteous, that's what it has to be. The issue isn't are you better than the tax collector, you know, who's betrayed his country? Are you better than the dad who has betrayed his family and run off? Are you better than the guy around the corner who's kind of a reprobate? You know what, the standard isn't even, are you as good as Billy Graham? It's not the standard. The issue is to match God. The question is not, am I better than my neighbor? The question is, am I as good as God? I don't think any of us would be so bold as to say we've got that, but see, if you want to self-justify, that's the goal. That's where you have to go. And our friends and neighbors and loved ones who do not know Jesus and are trying to get there by being good, we have to help them understand that's the goal. You get the wrong tape measure and you can't get there. I used to, when I was, you know, a kid, junior high, high school, we lived in Kansas. I used to listen to the St. Louis Cardinal games. 
could, you could usually get them pretty good at night after the sun went down and the radio waves were coming in loud and clear. Harry Carey was the announcer. Those of you who are familiar with baseball lore, you know Harry Carey. He really became famous with the Cubs as the announcer, but he was quite famous with the Cardinals for many years before that. And he interviewed one night, he interviewed the catcher Bob Euchre. Some of you will remember Bob Euchre. He later became more famous for his humor than he ever was for his baseball, right? I think he was in the movie Major League and been all over the place because he's such a funny guy. Well, on this night, Euchre had hit a, hit a hard ground ball to the shortstop, the shortstop booted, but the official scorer called it an error instead of a hit. So after the game, Harry Carey is, inter is, is interviewing Bob Euchre, and he says, you know, let me ask you about that, uh, about that error, Bob. He said, I suppose you would, you would a lot rather have seen that called a hit instead of an error. And Bob Euchre said, well, in my system, they're all hits. He said, I don't, if I walk, whether I walk, get on by the fielder's choice, he said, any time I hit the ball hard, it's a hit. That's, that's just the way I, that's, that's the way I judge. And Harry, Harry Carey was taken aback for a minute, you know. Never heard a system like this. He, he finally said, well, Bob, by your, by your system, what are you hitting right now? He said, 745. I mean, you didn't, you didn't bat an eye, hitting 745 by my own system. By his own system, he was the greatest hitter that ever walked the face of the earth. He was good. By Major League Baseball standards, he was exactly a 200-hitter lifetime which probably explains why his baseball career was so short, right? He was not a good hitter, except by his own standard. But this is exactly what we're doing when we're offering God our self-justification. We're measuring with the wrong tape measure. We're using the measurement of other people, the standard of their performance, and saying, I think I'm a little better. And declaring ourselves righteous. That's one problem with self-sufficiency. Second problem, it's not only the wrong tape, tape measure, but it's the wrong target measured. The wrong target measured. We're measuring the wrong thing. This man is measuring his external behavior instead of his internal character. So you can kind of imagine a conversation between him and God. Well, listen, God, I, I, here he is, self-justifying. I don't rob. I, I've never robbed a store in my life. I don't cheat, don't commit adultery. I tithe. I do my religious rituals. I get to church every Sunday. And now you can hear God say, yeah, that's great. How's your heart? How's your heart? How are you doing with patience? How are you doing with long-suffering? How are you doing with gentleness? How are you doing with joy? How are you doing with repentance? How's your heart? There would have been no comment. No comment. He'd forgotten what the Bible says in 1 Samuel 16, 7. Again, I know it's kind of buried in the Old Testament. I still say it's one of the key verses in the whole Bible. 1, Corinthians, 1 Samuel 16, 7, where God says, For the Lord sees not as man sees, for man looks on outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. So much of Scripture will become more clear to you when you understand it's speaking of a God who looks on the heart. In one sense, he doesn't even care about outward appearance. You say, well, why is there so much about outward appearance? To tell you that you're not meeting the standard, number one. And then when you finally accept Christ as Savior, to tell you how you need to live to live up to the, to the life that he's now given you. But it's not to tell you how to get right with him. Never. Measuring the wrong standard. The heart of man, when God looks on that heart, he sees enough in the unregenerate heart to seek the Titanic and in the best of people. The Bible says concerning the heart of man, unjustified, before we come to faith in Christ, of the best of us, it says that the heart is deceitful above all things, deceitful. It will fool you. It will tell you you're okay. It'll keep telling you you're okay. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately ill. Who can know it? Desperately ill is the Hebrew word anush. It means terminally sick. 
You are born with a terminal condition. Carter and Gunner have been born with a terminal condition. That's why we pray that they will come to faith in Jesus Christ at a young age so that terminal condition is replaced with what? With a new heart. If the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately ill, what do you need? You need a new heart. It's not a question, beloved, of kind of fixing up the old heart. That's kind of what moralism is about. It's trying to, you know, put stuff around the old us to make us look good. But what we need is a heart transplant, which is exactly what the Bible recognizes, even in the Old Testament. What was the whole emphasis of the new covenant that God talks about in Ezekiel? Here, just listen to this, Ezekiel 36. He says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. That's the new covenant promised in the Old Testament that becomes available based on the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus says at communion, when he establishes communion with his disciples, he takes the cup and he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This is the basis for the new heart that I want to give you. This is the foundation for you becoming right with God. This is the only way that can happen. I'm buying for you a new heart at the price of my death and resurrection in your place. But you have to accept it. You have heart trouble. Doctor tells you you need a heart transplant. You get on the list. They call you up and say, we got a new heart. Somebody died so that you can live, and you say, well, thanks anyway, but I'll, I'll pass. That's what we're doing when we tell Jesus, no, I'll do it my own way. Thank you very much. We are, in, in essence, beloved, spitting in the face of God. It's no wonder that insult is a capital offense, is it? Suggest we can buy our own way in is the most insulting thing we could ever say. You know, it's, it's, it's like robbing somebody's Porsche and taking it out and, you know, totaling it in some kind of a wreck and then coming back and offering your little match car toy in, in replacement. <laughs> Thank you very much, right? It's laughable. So is trying to buy God off trying to say that we are sufficient. We are targeting the wrong thing. It's not the outward actions. It's the unregenerate heart that God is looking at. And the only way that that can be made right is to have a heart replacement, a heart that's been bought and paid for by Jesus Christ. That's what gospel is all about. It's declaring yourself unrighteous just like God does. It's declaring yourself unworthy just like God does. It's repenting on your knees, on your face before him, and then saying, but thank you for the gift of life. I accept it. So the wrong way to get in with God is to declare ourselves accepted based on our own efforts, self-righteousness, self-sufficiency, self-justification, self-promotion, self-anything. It's all anathema to God. Because he hates us? No. Because he loves us enough to pay the price that we owe for who we are. We may meet our own standards, but we will never meet his. The only one who has met his standard is his son, Jesus Christ. It's on the basis of his life of perfection that we can have a new heart. The tendency of the human heart is to think I can do it on my own. It's just, you know, it's just our natural thing. It, we, it shows up everywhere in society. The sound of music. We all love the movie, right? Some of the girls love the movie. I don't know about the guys. But the girls love the movie. You remember where Maria, Julie Andrews, finally figures out, you know, she's this, she's this you know, young lady from a convent, comes to take care of these kids, and eventually the captain finally recognizes her virtues and falls in love with her. Remember that? And at the moment she recognizes the captain loves her, she breaks out into song. It's a musical. What would you expect, right? She breaks out into song. Do you remember the song? Here's what she sings. She sings, nothing comes from nothing. Nothing ever could. So somewhere in my youth or childhood, I must have done something good. 
To be loved by this, I must have done something good. I did something to earn this. I didn't even know I did it, but I must have earned this. The human heart says, you must earn it. The, the heart of God says, you can never earn it. But I'll give it to you. Free of charge. What you can never earn, he has already earned for you. Let me give you one more indication. It's in Deuteronomy. Turn there if you've got your Bible. Deuteronomy 34. You'll think this is a strange passage, but let me close with it, and I think I can show you why it's important. Deuteronomy 34. Beginning in verse 5. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, not in the land of Canaan, not in the promised land, not in the land that he had been leading these people toward. He didn't die there. He died in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he, God, buried him in the valley of the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor. But no one knows the place of his burial to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died, and his eye was, not, was undimmed, his vigor unabated. And the people of Israel wept for Moses on the plains of Moab for 30 days, and then the days of weeping and, Mo and, and mourning for, Moab, uh, for Moses were over. Okay, so Moses died, so what? Here's what. Why is this significant? Why is it in the Bible? Here's why. Moses was the man through whom the Old Covenant came. Moses was the messenger and mediator of the law of God that expressed the character of God. But what God is saying here is, even the messenger of the law, the one who brought the requirement and the standard, even he could not keep it. Why is he dying outside the law, outside the land? Because he disobeyed. Was Moses such a bad guy? No, of course not. But see, God is using a physical thing here to do what he often does to, to make a spiritual truth. And the spiritual truth is that little thing that Moses did, and by the way, it was no little thing when you understand the implications of it. Moses, remember, struck the rock instead of speaking the rock to get water. And God said, you've disobeyed. See, the reason that was so important is because the rock represented Christ. Read 1 Corinthians 10 sometime. And he'd already struck the rock once. You don't strike the rock twice. You don't kill Christ twice. Unless you refuse to accept him. So here's the messenger of the covenant. Here's the one through whom the law came. Here's the one that gave the law. And he can't keep the law, and so he does not have the promised land. What's God trying to say? He's saying your good is not good enough. Moses wasn't good enough. You won't be good enough. No one can be good enough except for Jesus Christ. That's the message. But we can accept the gift. Have you, have you accepted the gift? Such good news. The question isn't, am I better than my neighbor? The question is, am I as good as God? And the answer is no, but Jesus was. And I take him as my savior. You taking him as your savior? Take him as your savior. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word Lord, at the heart of all of us is this desire to want to earn our way. We're Americans after all. All things are possible. And so we want to earn our way. And all it does is lead us further astray until the moment we recognize, uh-oh, I can't get there from here. I can't be justified in this way. I can't be declared righteous by God on the basis of my own works. My good will never outweigh my bad anyway, but even if it did, it wouldn't be enough because the standard is perfection. Thankfully, perfection is available to me through the person of Jesus Christ. Father, please Take the blinders off. Make this so crystal clear to anyone who's here today that doesn't know you, that's never accepted your gift. I pray that today would be the day that they would do so. 
As we take just a moment in the quietness of our heart, I'm going to ask you to just ask God, what is it you want from me in response to this message? Perhaps it's to ask Jesus into your heart for the first time. Perhaps it's a determination now that you've heard this as a believer to make sure that friends and neighbors and loved ones who don't know Jesus at least have the opportunity to hear. Let's pray before him in the quietness of the moment. Father, we give you thanks for the gift of the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Thank you that he is as alive today as he was the day that he walked the earth and gave this sermon. We thankfully commit our lives to you. Lord, we abhor the sin that has kept us from you. We realize that even as a Christian, we will still fail, we will still fall. But you tell us if we are faithful and just, if, if we will confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we thank you. Take us down, Father, so that we can come up. Help us to realize the truth of that last principle, that the only way up is down, but that if we continue to try and push ourselves up, we will only fail. Thank you for the, thank you for the love of God shed abroad in our hearts. Thank you for the gift of Jesus. In the bottom of our hearts, we thank you. In his name we pray, amen.